going on, everybody? It's your boy, the Lo-Fi Horror Guy. Welcome to another episode of the Lo-Fi Horror Guy's Growing On You Live. Today, we're going to be having on my dude, Ryan Spindell. He did, most recently, the Mortuary Collection. This is my really cool media book, Bad Boy. Really, really sick. Uh, I'm super excited. I just got that bad boy in a couple of days ago. If you guys get a chance to check out the Mortuary Collection, I would absolutely do so. I'm really excited for this. I'm really excited to have him on, have this opportunity here. Uh, he's done some absolutely sick shorts, uh, really cool uh, uh, films as well. So we're going to dig into that and much more. Let's see here. Let's get sent. This bad boy started. Let's see. <laughs> Ryan, how's it going, man? It's good. It's good. It's connecting. Is, this is, is this, cool. Uh, uh oh, let's see here. All right, so we got to go. Ah, there we go. There you are. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, man. I appreciate this. This is awesome. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for having me. How come? Why does yours look so good and stable and mine is all up close and weird? I guess I, I got to hold mine, huh? After, after a couple of these things, I had to buy a stand. That's, uh, that's, that's about as professional as this gets. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I got a light here. Let me see if I can give, give you a little bit more. All a little right, bit cool. more viewage. <clears throat> uh, no, this is awesome. I'm I'm really excited to be here, man. I, I, I love your uh, I love your questions. I love right. anything that's it's a little shake up is uh, is welcomed at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, generally I have a little bit of an outline, you know, but as far as we're gonna have us like a good half hour here, I figured I'd dig into the good nitty gritty and kind of you know in my research I wanted to dig into some of your shorts and and look uh you know take a little bit of a. Uh, a, a seeing eyeglass to some of those, if you will. Well, I apologize that you had to go uh, deep into the doldrums. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. I love it, I love it. First of all, let me ask you as far as initially, you know, as a young man, not being so much of a horror fan, you know, not really, really being into the genre, what were some stories, movies, or TV shows, you know, maybe that you kind of strayed from as a young man, but growing up and then your interest peaked, you're like, oh, Okay, I should have watched that one. I don't miss. I I took a hard turn. So I, I had uh, and and I found this is a really common movie to have done this to people in my general age. But I had a a bad experience with a Nightmare on Elm Street when I was like five. Like I I, I watched <laughs> yeah. it way way too early. To be honest, it was like fifty percent probably manufactured memories of what it was in my head because I think I was so uh, just shocked at what I was seeing that it, it sort of broke me for a really long time. So I was kind of just a hard no on horror. I would say the only horror movies that kind of slipped through the cracks, which probably won't surprise you, is Creepshow. Um, mm. Because that had this like weird animation component that would always make me feel like it wasn't going to be that scary. So it would like lure me in and then sort of yeah. pull the rug out from under me. Um, totally. But I remember, um, I, I remember, this is like embarrassing, which is why it's, it's, it's good to talk about. But I remember when I was probably like nine or so, and we had a Halloween party, and my mom, who was, who's a very anti-horror movie person, okay. um, wanted to get a scary movie for us. So she got Something Wicked This Way Comes, the Disney movie. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I remember being like, you know, out at the time, nine years old is not super young. And so I'm like trying to look cool in front of my friends. But I'm like... <laughs> scared shitless i'm kind of sitting in the back of the room and kind of w watching with half my face and i don't think I, I think i figured out some excuse to not finish that movie um until way way later when i finally went back to it but it's interesting because that oh, movie wow. now when i think about it like the horror the fantasy the sort of gothic like sort of um, gothic americana aspect of it is very very much up my alley and probably somehow is like one of the key components to, to what I ended up doing later on, even though I sort of tried to yeah. block it out. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, honestly, you know, like that, or like the watcher in the woods. Had you ever seen that one? Oh, hell yeah, man. That, I mean, that's, but not till yeah. later again, not till I was like, not till right. a few years ago. Right. Yeah. And, okay. you know, and, and it's so funny because those were like, they're kind of more toward, like you think it's supposed to be Disney and it's supposed to be, you know, a kid movie and you watch it and you're like, what kids are supposed to be watching this? <laughs> uh, yeah. Pretty damn creepy. <laughs> that one's pretty, pretty dark. I also remember, it's yeah. not a movie, but I remember um, going to Disney World when I was, you know, again, too young to be a big baby and just being so scared of the Haunted Mansion that I pitched a fit and I waited outside the Haunted Mansion while the rest of my family went through. <laughs> but I was like, 
but I wanted to know everything. I was like, tell me what you see. Give me details. Give me a blow by blow. blow. But I was so scared of being scared. It's, it's really <laughs> surreal. It's, it's almost like, it's sort of like a preacher's daughter scenario where I, I was like kept away from it my whole life. And then I, when, I, when I found it finally around eighth grade, I just sort of went all in and never turned back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that that's funny, but still kind of living vicariously with it, though, because you know it's like I don't want to go in, but tell me everything about it. You know, exactly, like that. exactly. Like that. That's funny. <laughs> so now with your work, you know, one thing that I have noticed through your shorts and now through your feature, you know, I've noticed a comedic element always. You know, as far as there's a balance between humor and horror. What were some of your comedic interests early on, as far as maybe actors or movies, uh, you know, styles? What were what were some interests early on? And even today. Yeah, I mean, so this is interesting because I had never considered this until you sort of asked me that question earlier when you sort mm -hmm. of sent me the, the preemptive questions. Um, and I was all comedy. Like, I was hardcore comedy. I think because I didn't do horror. And of course, like uh, anyone my age, like the Spielberg stuff, the, uh, the Joe Dante stuff, that kind of stuff that was all like, of course, that, that's, that's a huge component of what I do. But mostly what me and my friends would watch is pure absurdist comedy. And I would rent the same <laughs> movies again and again and again. So basically, anything by Mel Brooks, anything by Gene <laughs> Wilder, The Three Amigos, um, all the, Zucker, the early Zucker Brother movies, like uh, Airplane, Naked Gun, and Hot Shots. I, I'm not kidding. I probably could recite Hot Shots <laughs> front to back. Uh, it, it's, oh, it's really shit. surreal. Okay. And I was thinking a lot about it. And I think that even though the two genres are, are very different in the content, I think the notion is kind of the same. It's this idea of these emotional yeah. highs and these emotional lows and, and this roller coaster feeling. And I was too terrified to actually do the horror stuff. So I chose the most extreme version of comedy that I could, which was those like absurdist, absurdist comedies. And so now that stuff is so baked into my brain that even when I write the darkest, most serious horror possible, it still sneaks through in, in between the cracks. Yeah. It's, it's really wild. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> is, is it, uh, was it the, the, the bundle of nerves? Was that with the two fellas that were fighting off the, the monsters? Like, was, was that what that one was? Okay, that, that yeah. one, it reminded me some of the dialogue then going back and forth was almost like a Three Stooges type thing, like just very kind of slapsticky. And you know, I was waiting for a wrench to come out of somewhere, and, you know, talk <laughs> him over the head there. <laughs> I mean, if I if I had had a wrench, I'd have done that. Honestly, um, <laughs> nice, nice. That was that. well. That was an interesting project because so basically, Legendary Pictures was doing this promotional thing for um, uh, Crimson Peak. And um, they came up with this really cool idea where they went to the YouTube sound stages across the world. They did this in like seven or eight locations. And they basically built these amazing sets, these like big Gothic living room sets. And they invited filmmakers to sort of come in for one day and make a short within this awesome sort of set. So they were like, hey, do you want to do you want to do one of these? And I'm, I'm like, I love Del Toro. So I'm like, of course, yes. And they're like, OK, cool. Um, can you shoot it in one week? And so I was like, yes. And I sort of went back and I was like, okay. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, can I see the set ahead of time? They're like, no, it's not built yet. And so basically in one week, I, I was like, okay, I'll write, the set's gonna have a door. So I'll write something at a door. And then uh, of course I'm gonna have monsters cause I love monsters. And um, I guess it's going, the story will be driven by dialogue. So I'm gonna go humorous because that's what I love. And, and I don't even know if I would, uh, trust myself to write a serious, dramatic, dialogue-driven uh, movie. <laughs> and so I, I, I wrote a thing, a thing set at a door, and basically we cast it, got the costumes, got whatever props we needed, and got those tentacles made, and within a week, we were shooting oh on the soundstage. Oh my stage. god. And I think wow. we shot it in six hours, because their, their, their version of a day, which you know I'm used to, a 12-hour day as an independent filmmaker, their idea of a day was like a six-hour shoot. So it was a really surreal, like weird experience, but it was so gratifying to be like, have an idea and one week later, it's like in the can. Yeah, wow, okay. Now, did they give you an explanation as far as what like it was going to look like or, you know, with, with you saying that you knew that you had a door and everything and it wasn't built, did they give uh, kind they, of like a, a, just an explanation of it? I knew it was going to be, I think there was like a, some concept art. So it was like, it was a living room space uh, and it was gonna have a door and I think a solarium were, were the only things that I knew about. And it had a second story, but I don't know if you could go up into it. 
Um, mm. it, it was pretty vague. It was kind of like a by the seat of the pants project through and through. Sure. But that was what was so cool about it was like, what can you do with sort of no, no prep time and, and no real budget, but like this amazing set. Totally. Yeah. I, I love that. We're, we're going to dig into your shorts right now. That was going to be something I do have a couple of questions about that. Uh, but first sure. I wanted to ask about as far as with your interest in film, how did it go from that to making the return? That was your very first short, correct? Very short. Um, so the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the return was cool. So I went to uh, film school at Florida state. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if they do this anymore, but there was this period of time where Coca-Cola was doing this thing called the Coca-Cola Refreshing Filmmaker Awards. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. And so, I remember so the, hearing the about gist... it. I don't make movies or anything, but yeah, I remember okay, hearing about Okay, okay. So here's the gist. The gist is basically like the, the top 12 film schools, you know, in the country, um, all were, anyone in those schools could apply. And basically they would choose, I think five, pitches and they would give you like 7,500 bucks. Um, and you could make basically a short film slat that involves Coca-Cola. And then the cool thing was, was the winning short film got put in movie theaters, like as an advertisement before movies, like all over the country. Oh, so wow. it was huge. It was huge for like a, a film student to have your, your little short film, like in theaters. Um, yeah. And so, okay. so I, I ended up getting one of those and, uh, and we made that thing in, in a day. <laughs> um, with just film, film equipment that we had. And uh, we got a really good uh, makeup artist, which was really cool to come in. Um, and, and yeah, we just, we just churned that thing out and, and spit it out um, on, during the Christmas break between, between semesters. And so it wasn't my first film. I think oh. I'd made one film in film school prior, but it was like my second short ever. Mm. And, and of course it was like, the tricky part was, I think it had to be 90 seconds long. So I did write something that was short. And then the, my, my, my absolute shortest cut of it was like a minute, uh, like two minutes or something. And then it was like, okay, uh, now cut it down to 90 seconds. And so it was like, okay, I guess we're just cut, cut, cut. So it sort of forced me to really understand the, the commercial side of things and how it's like the story is secondary to like what you are able to cram in the time. But it was, it was really fun. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, that, and that's, that's a, that's a good point to be made too, just as far as, you know, with it being something and, even for it being a minute and then half or two minutes and then having to get cut down to that much more. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right, here we go. <laughs> it's, it's wild. Start That's wild. Industry. It's a, it's a testament. Like I, I, I'm sure those things are all online and they can be found somewhere, but it really is a testament mm -hmm. to what some people are able to pull off in 90 seconds that would, that, you know, a legit three act story with a, a setup, a midpoint, a, a reversal, a joke. It, it was really cool. Yeah, totally, totally. Next up, I wanted to ask about Kirksdale, which uh, for, for those that haven't seen the Mortuary Collection, there is a pretty cool uh, little snippet. It took me a couple times of watching it, but then all of a sudden I went back and I'm like, ah, okay, I, I see it now. I see what, I see, I see that, that's cool. Tell us about mm -hmm. some of the practical effects that were made for the, for, for the, uh, for the short there. And then uh, some of the small details as far as like, I saw at one point there was a calendar that was a 1961 Spindell and brother or Spindell and Sons <laughs> calendar. Let, let's let's dig into that a little bit. You know some of the stuff that you had made for the short. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. So Kirkstill was my um, Kirkstill was my my thesis film in film school, um, mm, okay. and so that was the biggest project that they would sort of uh, give you. So basically, it would be like um, you know, like you know you'd make three short films, and then for your final thesis film, like the school would turn into a mini studio and they would give you like a little budget, I think like $4,000 for like everything, but also they'd provide, you know, cameras, equipment, crew, the crew was all students. Uh, and we shot everything on film, which was, which is pretty cool. Um, but the wild thing was, and, and it's almost hard for me to even, to even imagine how we did this, but there was zero visual effects at all. So like, even if a C stand was in a shot, like it was in the shot, like if there was just practical effects, like, it was just practical effects. There was like no other options at that point in time because oh, the, the, in film school, we just didn't have access to the, the kind of artists that could pull off, you know, photo realistic. So, um, so yeah, so the practical effects were amazing. We ended up working with this guy named uh, Josh Council from Orlando who came up and did all of our practical effects. And it was the first time I'd ever done practical effects to that degree. Uh, and it was really, mm -hmm. really cool. And then all those details, those are just like, I mean, the, if anything, the mortuary collection is like the ultimate, uh, 
the ultimate version of that in which like every frame yeah. has like 30, 30 different details. I'm not super keen yeah. on having my name in there at this point. Like that was a little bit indulgent, I think at the time, um, <laughs> but it was really fun. And my dad, my dad is a doctor and he always had these like Norman Rockwell, like doctor calendars that looked just like that. So it was like sort of inspired by oh, kind of growing okay. up around wow. medical professionals. Wow. Okay. I love that. That's, that, that, that is, that's awesome. It was, it was really, I think I wanted to, I can say it was the mortuary collection that made me go back and look even closer at the, the shorts even, cause just seeing some of the small details and some of the small things that I wasn't seeing the first couple of times, I went back and looked at the shorts a little bit closer and I'm like, okay, all right. Now I'm seeing some extra shit here that I didn't see the first time with this either. <laughs> so that's always fun. It's always fun to see some of that stuff tucked in and, you know, you look a little bit closer and it's there. I like that. I, I love that. I mean, I think my, my favorite filmmakers now are, are the people that, that really, really put the extra effort into those kind of details. I mean, that's what makes mm -hmm. the difference between a movie you see once and it has like some impact and you forget about it. And those movies that you revisit again and again and again, those mm -hmm. the Peter Jackson movies, um, Oh man, yeah. let me, uh, I wonder if I got a turn off. I got like a screen time. I've got like a limiter on my Instagram. I don't know if it's going to knock me out. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, just, <laughs> oh, no. we'll check it out. Okay. All right. Well, it, I mean, if, if it does, if you need to email me or whatnot and you wanted to keep on going, or if you just wanted to let me know as far as like a further date or something like that, I, oh, can, no, I, I can, can hook I back can, up with you. If, if I get popped off, let me just, just log back on. I just have to probably reset it. Oh, okay. I, I, gotcha. Cool. I, it, it's, a, it's an app that keeps me from using uh, Instagram uh less than 15 minutes a day which i'm oh, pretty strict nice. to myself <laughs> <laughs> okay okay all right good yeah i mean that, that, that's that's a good thing a little self-control you know that, that I, don't, I don't think that hurts anybody yeah <laughs> yeah a little a little app dictated self-control <laughs> <laughs> yeah too sure <laughs> no, uh so now the, the the window was the next one i wanted to touch on and that kind of touches on this realm that is especially uh, that i love you know as far as the horror adjacent you know it's kind of something dark you know but it's not quite a horror movie tell us about the inspiration and in writing for the window so the window is um that's based on an urban legend that i first became aware of in this uh the scary stories to tell in the dark books from when i was a kid oh yeah um, okay yeah so there's like a short sort of really abbreviated version of that story I think in the first or second book, and it had always uh, it had always stuck with me as like that one of those endings. It's like, how have I not seen a million people do this sort of big twisteroo? Uh, and yeah. so when it came to writing my, I think that was my second film in film school um, that I, I sort of pitched that idea, and my, my instructors really liked it. It ended up being weirdly like one of the most successful films I did in film school. I think it's because it it really opened itself to a much wider audience. And it kind of got me into mm -hmm. festivals that, that you wouldn't normally get to go to as a, as a horror filmmaker, which is really cool. Mm, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. You know, and that, that was one of those things too, where it was cool, where, you know, it was well, like, I, like I say, it was a little bit different, especially looking at, you know, other of your works. It was something that still had that little, you know, that little ingredient. There was still the spice of like something kind of creepy and dark, you know, going on, but yet kind of drifting into more like a dramatic, you know, uh, in a deep story, like, you know, it kind of makes you think about, you know, as far as if you have grandparents in a home or something, like, go and give them a call. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. It, 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 hurt, it hurt, hurt a little bit, you know? Totally. I had my, my grandmother lived with us for a long time, and she was sort of bedridden. And I remember that being something that really impacted me. Um, and, and I was always kind of scared of her, and I would kind of avoid her. And it wasn't until after mm -hmm. she passed away later on, as I sort of grew up a little bit, and I realized like start talking to people and she was like the coolest lady. And I have this sort of guilt that I never went back there and gave her a chance because I was just a kid and, and the idea of, of, of old people was scary to me. And so I think I was really sort of exploring some of that in that movie. But plus it kind of gave me sure. this excuse to play with this Jean-Pierre Junet aesthetic and like sort of take this sort of simple kind of dark drama and see if I could really play with the environment and, and do something sort of um, stylistic and cool with it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, and, and myself, I guess, being a Stephen King fan, different things like, you, you know, you have like Shawshank Redemption or the Green Mile, you know, when he steps out of those realms of being straight up horror, like sometimes that's some of my favorite stuff in the world is when somebody that is very involved in the horror community goes and does something outside of that, but still has those little pinches where you're like, I know this guy's into horror Me too. or another. I got to look into his other shit. So totally, yeah, that was totally. especially cool. I love, I love that. Stuff. With the uh, with with the initial the, the the first gentleman that was right by the window there and kind of talking about what he sees and everything there's there's a there's a point where he falls back having a head attack or, or a heart attack of, of of some sort 
smacks his head on the bar there. Was he all right? Or what, was that a sound effect that was added in? <laughs> no, I think so. He never complained about it, but I'm pretty sure he actually like cracked his head on the, on the thing. <laughs> it was loud. <laughs> it was like, pretty geez. loud. <laughs> it, and it was, I remember um, when I shot that too. So those two guys were two of the heads of the theater department at FSU. Mm. And oh, wow. they had, they were, had been actors originally, um, you know, back in the day, but they, and they'd done some, some films for the film school a long time ago, but like they'd had terrible experiences. So the, the theater school and the film school were kind of divided. It was like a, a, a rivalry of some, of some sort. Um, where, you know, the film people didn't think the, or the, the theater people didn't think the film people respected the actors and, and vice versa. And so when I went out to these guys and pitched to them and I got them, I remember my, my professor, the film professor saying like, look, th this is the first time the theater school has like bridged the gap here. Uh, and you're ha you happen to be casting the head of the whole department. So like, don't fuck this up basically oh. was the, uh, <laughs> was the, <laughs> yeah. was the consensus. So there's a lot of extra pressure there, um, but those guys were awesome. Mm -hmm. And then um, I don't want to take all the credit, but from there, sorry about that. Um, oh, no, you got you. Can you hear me? Okay, yep. cool. Yep, um, everything good. Yeah. So, so from that day forth, the, the, the theater program was a lot friendlier with the film program. And I, I think, I think everybody was better for it. Wow. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's awesome. And then being I mean, what a what an opportunity to be able to work with some higher ups as well and you know, them want to be part be part of that. That's cool. Yeah, but scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I guess I could I can see that too. Lots of added pressure. You know, you're like, well, this this went from maybe being a little bit of a simple thing to uh, that much harder. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, tell us, you know, something kind of sidetracking from that. What would be a time that you can tell us where you really wanted something? And when you finally got it, you're kind of wishing that you hadn't. This is kind of a broad question, but if anybody has <sighs> seen the short, they would understand it. Oh, man. Uh, you mean film-related or life-related? Sure. You know, whichever would be easy. <clears throat> now that I'm asking this out loud, it, uh, it sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think, the, I think a, a, a career in filmmaking is, is sort of that way, in that there's there's an idea of what it would be like to, to, to live your life as a, as a filmmaker, or as a director. Um, and, uh, and people tell you, oh, it's tougher than you think. And, and, and you, 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 you nod your head and you agree, but you don't, you don't really believe it. You kind of, cause to, to, I think to even, you know, go, go down this path, you got to have um, a somewhat inflated self ego to some degree, or, or think that you have something really significant to off offer. And, um, I think being being a, a working director now and it being sort of my primary source of income and what I spend all day every day doing, uh, <laughs> it, it is a little bit of a careful what you wish for scenario because it's a it's a tough life and it's something that I, I, I when I when I sort of mentor kids who are coming out of film school I, I talk to them a lot about it and, and and it's been said before by people smarter than me that um, you know if there's anything else you can do and be happy literally anything else you can do uh, do that. Uh, but if somebody says, is there anything else you can do and you don't have an answer, you say no, then, then filmmaking is the, the way to go. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's, it's one interesting detail hitting on that. And you mentioned that too, listening to your interviews and, and listening to uh, reading different things that you've done is mentioning, you know, the breakdown of a scene, you know, and kind of going back and editing something and something that you were so, you know, uh, 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 just in love with and kind of passionate about getting made and then having to sit down and just re go over and over and over a certain scene and by the end of it you know by the end of festivals and different things you don't want anything to do with it you know it's like oh, oh yeah man i'd never even <laughs> thought of that before but it totally makes sense you know like unfortunately it totally makes sense <laughs> you know from from it, it, no, being a is. fan as opposed to making well that's the that's the the weird part is that you spend years of your life on every project and yeah but like you said by the time you're done with it you don't ever want to watch it again. So you, you kind of spend all of this sort of time and energy, emotional energy and physical energy to make a thing. And then you're like, and I never want to see it again. That's the sort of <laughs> irony of, of being a filmmaker. I think that you, 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 it's only for others and, and the response that others have towards you uh, mm -hmm. that keeps you going forward. It, it, it's, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I mean, and you know, but it's very real, you know, as far as for, for being able to say that and not for, you know, for just kind of falling down a, a track of, having to, to push out what people want to hear, you know, I appreciate hearing those things like that just as far as, cause like there's some people that are out there that really, you know, want to put it on a pedestal and be like, that's exactly what I want to do. And then maybe get into it. And they're like, Oh, and I messed up. I just went and spent all this money on college and 
So uh, that, that's a good point. I like that. I like hearing that. Yeah, I mean, that was a good thing about film school, I think, at least my film school, it was a really intense, like a really, really physically and emotionally intense program. Mm. And it, you know, by the time you were done the, the three year, the three year stint, I think you had a pretty good idea whether you had uh, the sort of makeup it takes to, to, to make this a living or, or if you were better off to do something else, which is like an expensive way to figure it out, I guess, but, um, but effective. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, touche. Okay, nice. <laughs> Next, I, I wanted to I wanted to talk about the root of the problem. Uh, now, mm -hmm. as far, was this was this in, was this inspired by a story that you had told your brother when when you guys were were younger, or was that was that just something I was kind of mixing up? You're half right. It's it's uh, inspired by a, a story that I told my brother, but I wasn't much younger. I was I was pretty old when I told him this. Story. <laughs> I think I was probably like oh okay. I was probably like 30 years old when I like was scaring the, <laughs> the crap out of my uh, nine year old brother, which gives you a, a, a pretty good indicator of uh, my maturity level. Um, but yeah, he, he, he was losing teeth. And I was like, I'd always thought that the tooth fairy is a pretty creepy idea. But I, I was like, it's interesting because there, there isn't really a whole lot of strong mythology for, for tooth fairies, mm -hmm. or, or if there are, I, I wasn't aware of it. So, you know, cause you think of all these things that we knew growing up, everything from even like ring around the rosy, when you like do the research, you're like, oh, that's a dark thing. That was originally yeah. something dark that yeah. we've turned light. And so I was like, I guess like yeah. the um, tooth fairy mythos has to be, there has to be something like interesting to that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I started digging and there wasn't. And then I was like, well, that's kind of a bummer. But then I thought, well, that's kind of awesome. Cause now I can just make up my own mythology for how this, this all, all works. And the dentist yeah. office, which we're all scared of being going to the dentist. And um, I never had a cavity, so I'd never had a, a needle in my mouth. I never had, I was like, had this deep, deep fear of, of what that would actually be like when the time comes. And so all of those things kind of came together to make that short. And that short was, um, that short was made for all, no, like $8,000, I think at the end of the day. Um, oh, and wow. it, was, it was, yeah, it was made for like, I sh that whole set, um, the whole set was built uh, in my friend's warehouse. And I basically traveled around LA for about three months. And anytime somebody was tearing down a set, I would steal, I would get as many free walls as I could until I had enough to sort of Frankenstein them all together to make uh, the set that we had for that thing. But every single thing in that was like found on the side of the road or, or re restructured by hand. It was, it was a very Damn. like intensely like, demanding sort of creatively demanding project to put together because there was no money and, and sort of no resources. Um, mm. But it was also the, the short that kind of, I had been in LA for a little while at the time, I'd been taking a million meetings and I wasn't making anything. And I, I was really getting sort of uh, anxious about the fact that I, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I'd gone two years or something without even like behind the, being behind the camera. And so that was sort of mm. the, the reset, like, look, let's go, me and my cinematographer and my co-writer, let's just take a thousand dollars a piece, throw them in a pot, go to this warehouse, build this set and like make something and like sort of remind ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. And, and that, that short really did kind of teach me that I, I could sort of make things outside of the, the bubble of film school and kind of allowed me to move forward yeah. um, to, to getting the babysitter murders made, which, which led to the mortuary collection and so on and so yeah. forth. Nice. Okay. Okay. And, you know, and I think that brings along the spirit a little bit as far as having to, yeah, probably a lot more headache, you know, as far as not having the money to kind of just be like, all right, this is what we're going to do. But, you know, that brings along a little bit of the spirit of like a movie like The Evil Dead or, you know, earlier Sam Raimi type stuff where it's like, hey, we have to make this work, you know, uh, no matter how cheesy it's going to be or whatever, you know, so if we kind of have to band together to get it to make it happen, you know, you, I think the spirit is, is, is there and kind of makes up for uh, the, the money to have to put towards something. Oh yeah, I mean, I would agree a hundred percent. It's the kind of thing I look for too when I'm when I'm watching other people's films. Like I, I feel like I'm at the point now where I can tell when someone was just someone just kind of shit something out. They got a budget, they, they churned it out, they moved on, and I can tell when somebody's slaved away to sort of make every single detail and every component the best that can be. And you, you bring up the Evil Dead too. The ultimate example of there's you can see over the set walls, you can see the, the, <laughs> the fishing line. Yeah. Like you see the seams of that movie, but Sam didn't care. He's like, he's like, I'm just gonna do the biggest, craziest, most ambitious thing I possibly can. Seems be damned. And it's one of the things mm -hmm. that we love the most about it. Yep, 
Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, that that movie. I mean, we could probably do a whole 45 minute hour long interview just about that movie. But uh, I'll digress from, <laughs> from that. <laughs> Got to keep on track a little bit. I wanted to ask really quick as far as one other thing with the root of the problem. Was there a signif- uh, significance behind the room 109? Yeah, so so <laughs> basically, the first movie I ever made uh, in film school was called Room 109. It was all set in a hotel room. So mm. it's basically me recycling these like components from other projects again and again and again. Because what happens as a director is, you know, at the time I was making all the decisions, but sometimes you'll have a crew and they'll come up to you and they'll be like, uh, okay, uh, there's a license plate in this car. What number do you want the license plate to be? And you have to have a number or like, what do you want the address of this place? What do you want this phone number to be? What do you want the name of this product to be? And so through that, through those questions, I was like, well, I've done this before. And I, so I basically have started reusing those components again and again and again. So okay. um, all of the, all of the movies are, are, are linked in one way or another to sort of a universe, I guess you can say, but sure. there's um like in root of the problem, they have, um, there's a part at the beginning where she's taking these uh, pills mm-hmm. um, and they're called uh, Dr. PQ Finkelman's calming tablets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my friend, Josh Michael uh, did that artwork for me and we created that brand together. And then anytime there's been a brand since I was like, well, it's gotta be Finkelman's. So everything I've done <laughs> since is Finkelman's like yeah. the, the condoms in mortuary collection are all Finkelman's the plan C the booze that the, the frat brothers are drinking, every label, every brand. It's like, it's like our version of Acme. Um, yeah. Finkelman's for some reason, which is the most ridiculous name too. There's like nothing subtle about Finkelman's, but now it's, <laughs> it, it's forever. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and, yeah, that was another thing too. I mean, there was kind of, you know, some certain things riddled in there that, you know, that pop up in the, in the mortuary collection. And uh, that was another thing I was going to mention too, was, was seeing the old pill bottle. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, even even more shit. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to mention just because, and this is kind of me digging and looking at numbers and things. By the conclusion of the short, and it being you know almost like an artificial intelligence or alien type thing, and you know in skin suit, I started looking at the number one and nine, and that's AI. In the amazing, in the, in that's the, in the numeric. That's what I meant. That, that that's the that was my intention. Fuck yes, that is awesome. <laughs> Damn, that is so cool. I am uh, totally lying to you. You, you, you just you made that up, and I, I love it so much. So oh, I'm, no. I'm just going to oh, claim damn it. it. <laughs> oh no! Oh, I was like, dude, that is so cool. Oh, all right. Damn. Okay. <laughs> but did you see? Um, did you see what time the clock on the wall said? Mm. Two thirty. Tooth, hurdy. Ah, nice. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I, 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 I don't I believe you like that. Was a, that was a, this. <laughs> I feel like that was a pit. I think that was a pity. Nice. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I, I, I like that. I like that. That's that, you know, there, there's, there's, that's, that's kind of the fun with, with humor is, you know, just kind of adding in the little, uh, the little silly shit and, I just wish I would have had my set, my, my snare drum and cymbal here. Though, <laughs> and along with it. Uh, you, you had mentioned as far as the half hour, did you want to cut right now? And then I can get a hold of you uh, at, a, at a further time here and we can kind of continue and do like a part two. Sure. I can go, I can go for about 15 more. Okay, cool. All right. Works, well, yeah. Let's, we'll try and crank through a little bit of this here. So sure, sure. Uh, the, the last one here, uh, bundle of nerves, give us one example of a, of a team dynamic in film that you're a fan of as far as maybe something that helped the rapport in this short here? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, I like uh, Sean and Ed and Sean of the Dead quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, let me, let me think here. That's a good question. I, I do know this. I can say that the... Um, when I was did Bundle of Nerves, I had um, I was had already written the first script of the Mortuary Collection, and mm-hmm. um, one key component of the Mortuary Collection that ended up not making the movie was the movie opened and closed with these two kind of bumbling cops, and the idea was um, the sort of like a, a blue collar version of X Files, but these cops are every day fighting tentacle monsters and ghosts and sea creatures, and all they want to do is just go home and crack a beer. And I loved that sort of the <laughs> dichotomy of that and like what it would be like to be yeah. a, a cop in Raven's End dealing with what you have to deal with. So um, in a way, uh, Bundle Nerves was, you know, while not officially 
a part of the mortuary collection because legally I don't think it can be. But um, that was like an ex like sort of my chance to play with what happens. Is there a way to find a story um, that involves two blue collar guys fighting a monster, but the, the story is not about the monster at all. The monster is just the sort of frosting on the cake. And really it's about these two guys grappling with the idea of possibly having a child. Um, and so, um, yeah, but as far as the, the dynamic goes, I mean, I, I'm really into those like, those uh, friendships in which the, the, the comedic shorthand is, is so fast that they just fire, it's rapid fire back and forth, which is a tricky yeah. thing to, to sort of pull off. And you kind of need the right actors because you can write it, but that can come off really terribly if you don't have the right sort of actors kind of with the right timing. Um, and luckily mm -hmm. those guys, uh, Casey and Sergio, um, I knew them sort of just from seeing a lot of their sketch comedy. And I knew that they had that rapport. Uh, and so they came in and just sort of brought the heat and, and did some fun improv and stuff <laughs> along the way. Okay, nice. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I can say as far as your earlier shorts, that would be one thing if if you had brought back that the team of those two fellas, I would love to see a little bit more, you know, just kind of where they go from there or, you know, kind of how they got to that point. That was one of my favorite things that, you know, it was funny because it's not really about the monsters at all, but that's kind of, you know, like something fresh, you know, in the sense of that type of a realm of a movie or a film, you know, of some, some sort as it's like, you're, that's, that's not even the focus of it. You know, this, all this crazy shit's happening. And it's like, that's a side story. I'm having a baby. What the hell am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there we back. Go. Oh. It's yep. my uh, yep. it's my limiter. My limiter keeps spitting me out. Um, oh, no. uh, okay. But yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I agree. I, I love that kind of stuff. And uh, and uh, that was a really. I think I'm probably going to try to explore that exact thing you're talking about um, with a future project, whether it be nice. mortuary collection related or or something else, because it's it's definitely a lot of fun to write. It, it's a little bit like, and I I definitely would never compare myself to Quentin Tarantino. Um, but I was just watching uh, Pulp Fiction again two nights ago, and it did occur to me that, you know, there's the whole thing where, where um, uh, Jules and uh, uh, what are the two characters' names? Um, the two hitmen are, are walking to sort of uh, kill those, the, the guys who stole the briefcase. Mm -hmm. And there's just like, they're just talking about whatever, just guy stuff, just friend, pal stuff. And I, I was like, man, it's, it's so fun to see like, just two two fellas talking, but like the whole <laughs> undercurrent is they're going to like kill a bunch of people. Um, yeah, right. So I think that, that that kind of thing is just is just really interesting, and it, 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 like you said, it's a, it's a nice way to fuse um, humor into sort of uh, what would otherwise be horror con scenarios. Yeah, totally, totally. Next up, I wanted to I wanted to ask about and this was kind of the the, the last uh, you know kind of draw as far as with the interview here was the mortuary collection. And I, I've heard in in different interviews you mentioned the excitement about you know something like just doing the the box art. Tell us about the artist and you know how you guys came to you know some of the the artwork that came about. This was the old bad boy that I just got in the mail here not mm. too long ago. Nice little media book. I, I had to buy a good uh, special <laughs> edition. I had to get it from Germany. Um, but it came. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, there's, yeah, there's that German release is incredible. And it has so the artwork inside is so rad, but I can't, I don't know what it says. I have no idea what the in interior says because it's all written in German, yeah. uh, but I absolutely love it. Um, yeah. And we are, I, I think you made a good choice. We are releasing on Blu-ray here, uh, April 20th. So just in a little oh, while. Sweet, okay, um, nice. So, so it is, there is gonna be a US Blu-ray, but honestly, I, I think that that cover is, uh, is the cooler of the two. Um, you just have to read German. Yeah, <laughs> get a German friend. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the artist is, is uh, uh, this artist, Vance Kelly, um, who's an incredible poster artist. And, and what I did with the Mortuary Collection, because we didn't have money we didn't really have any of the traditional things you need but what we did have is is sort of content that was uh somewhat inspired that we could share with people and to sort of hopefully attract people that were you know prior out of our league and so i, I sort of did this all the way through I, I became an expert at writing uh impassioned emails to artists and creators who i really love uh to try to get them to uh to come on board this tiny project and it went from Everywhere from our, you know, from actors, from getting someone like Clancy Brown to come on the project, to our special effects company, ADI, who are like an Oscar winning. They won an Oscar for Death Becomes Her. They're incredible. Mm. Um, definitely, they, they, they have no business doing a movie this small, uh, but they did because <laughs> they loved it. Uh, and even down to the poster artwork. And even now, I'm talking to people about 
doing a vinyl release of the soundtrack and getting some yes. really cool artwork. It's sort of one of my favorite parts is being able to work with all these different artists who work in different mediums and, uh, and kind of, you know, that's what I, how I started out sort of the arts and as a designer and sort of photography and that kind of thing is, is always in my bones. So I love uh, being able to interact with these people and, uh, and, and film is the best way to do it. Right. Cause you, you get to work with everyone, musicians and prop makers and, and digital artists and uh, performers and, and, and everything in between. Yeah, totally. That, that, that's so cool. And, and a little bit of a segue too. you mentioned the, the score and different things like that. One of the things that, you know, really popped up along with all the cool, you know, short stories and just the originality and the fun spirit with the Mortuary Collection was the score. After hearing the movie, some of the little like just the little dingles and different things like that were well in my, my head afterward. I wanted <laughs> to ask you and end things off. What, tell us about a movie, horror or non where the score became as much of a character as the characters did in the movie. Oh man. I mean, jo almost anything with John Williams, a bit, of oh, course, yeah. like how can I not say John Williams? But for mm -hmm. me, it's um, B back to the future. Back to the future is, uh, <laughs> is just, is, is the soundtrack that like, bum, bum, bum. Yeah. whatever that sort of those three chords hit, like I, I just, my, 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 heart races and i'm like excited i'm like this is gonna here comes the adventure here it comes i always remember in in three there's like one cue um where he's they're chasing the train and it's like the deloreans on the tracks and the train's pushing it and uh and marty has to jump on his hoverboard and go from the the car back to the train and those chords bum, bum, <laughs> bum. i'm just like ah it gets me every time I, I, I'm, I'm a total <laughs> nostalgia nerd for that stuff Totally, totally. I, I, you know, and I, I'm glad that you said that because I was thinking that automatically you were going to go to something like Jaws because that to me, I just, I, I think that always kind of categorizes, categorizes oh, yeah. in that. But a lot of people say that. So, you know, ha bring it up the old back to the future. That's a, a, a great choice. Great choice for sure. And, uh, <laughs> and, and well, well deserved <laughs> for them. Oh, yeah, Making absolutely. It, you know. <laughs> yeah. Look, man, this has been absolutely so, so awesome. Thank you so, so much, uh, you know, for taking the time first and foremost. And also, you know, for all that you do for, for us horror fans. And uh, we're really looking forward to what you have coming next. And uh, for those who haven't seen the shorts, go and watch them. I found them on, you, you have a Vimeo page. Um, uh, is, yep. that, is that your official page or did somebody else make that and put that shit up? <laughs> no, no, but I don't have anybody else. I do okay. everything over here. Um, but yeah, Beautiful. that's all me. It's, um, it's on my Vimeo page uh, and I'm on the Instagram and the, the Twitters if people want to chat about movies or horror or anything in between. And uh, yeah, and also, yeah, I'm supposed to talk about the, uh, the Blu-ray that comes out April 20th. It has um, one of the things I'm most proud about beyond the film is that, you know, we've been shooting this film we shot it piece by piece over several years because we didn't have the money to make it all at once. And um, the whole time, uh, my friend Nathaniel Beaver was shooting behind the scenes on the movie. And at the end of when we finished shooting, he had something like 23 or 30 hours of footage that he edited down his first cut of, uh, of all of the footage was something like 10 hours long. And then we asked the Blu-ray company, how much behind the scenes can we, can we put on there? And they're like two hours. And so we basically spent six months condensing 10 hours into two hours of in-depth, uh, really uh, amazingly edited um, videos. And they're not just fluff pieces. They're all about how we did everything, how we did the elevator sequence, how we did the special effects, how we did uh, how the performance, like all, all of the components that it took to make the movie, um, we kind of put in there as sort of like uh, uh, something for you know, filmmakers or, or aspiring filmmakers to kind of see how it's done um, to do it on their own because you know, Lord of the Rings, changed all of our lives with behind the scenes. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's something I'm really proud of and, and something that I definitely think people should check out um, if you get a chance. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just going to have to double dip and grab that one too because <laughs> I'll have to look and see if that, if that stuff's on here. I'm it not should sure be. if it is, but... It should oh, be, yeah. Okay. I okay. think so. I think well, so. It, if anything, you know, just to just to be able to support, I absolutely love, you know, people that are doing like, you know, different stuff like this and doing things that are original and having that in my own collection. So that that that's awesome. And thank you for including that because I didn't know that. That's sweet. I oh, can't yeah, wait to no. watch that stuff. No, thanks for letting me talk about it. It's a, it's something I'm uh, I'm pretty jazzed for people to see. Totally, totally. Man, <laughs> thank you so much. Once again, thank you very, very much. Everybody that hasn't seen this, this will be edited. I'll have this on my YouTube page. And for the little times that there was, you know, cuts with us and whatnot, I'll edit that out. So we won't have the, the blemishes there. <laughs> awesome. Dude, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. 
Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Well, you take care. Thank you very much for the time again. And you stay safe. Everybody, the Lo-Fi Horror Guy, my dude, Ryan Spindell. Check out his stuff. Bye, man. Peace. Bye. Dun, 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 He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah. Lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.